Okay, well, welcome everyone. Um, my name's Mark Gibson, I'm the Associate Dean Media at RMIT, uh, which includes the wonderful journalism programs that have organised this event, the Bachelor of Communications Journalism and the uh, Graduate Diploma. Thanks to all staff members who have been involved in organising the event, but I'd like to particularly thank uh, Dr. Hakim Ching, who took a real lead in, in, in the organisation. Um, thanks to all for your attendance. Uh, it's been a real buzz this week to have students back on campus. It was almost impossible to walk along Bowen Street at RMIT at lunchtime. There were so many students there. It was great to see that happening. Uh, and it's great to have a, a live audience here as well. Uh, and it's great that we've been joined this evening by the Dean of the College of Design and Social Context, Professor Tim Marshall, and the Dean of the School of Media Communication, uh, Professor Lisa French. Apart from these introductions, my role here is, uh, is to uh, give an acknowledgement of country. So I'd like to uh, affirm that RMIT acknowledges the people of the Woiwurrung and Boonwurrung language groups of the Eastern Kulin Nations on whose unceded lands uh, we conduct the business of the university. RMIT respectfully acknowledges their ancestors and elders, past and present. We also acknowledge the traditional custodians of the lands and borders across Australia where we conduct our business. With that then, I'd like to hand over to uh, the program manager for the two journalism programs at RMIT, Associate Professor Alex Wake, who will be our chair for this evening. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. Wobanjika, everyone. I just love that word. I understand it means not just welcome, but also to come with purpose. And I think to discuss this issue, is political journalism in Australia failing our democracy? We come with a purpose to learn and hopefully to do better. Um, so thank you very much for joining us here. And like Mark, I am absolutely delighted to be back in the presence of human beings and particularly um, welcome to all our first year students and graduate diploma students who have joined us here at RMIT this year. I'm so excited that you have chosen journalism as your um, intended profession. Just a little bit of history. Um, remember back in 2019, um, everyone in the media seemed to get it wrong. A lot of our first years weren't even close to voting. You were 14, 15 then? There was a lot of soul searching that went on after that election. People were saying, you know, the, the journos were too focused on the polls, we were too poll centric. The coverage seemed to be all about the leaders and TV stunts and not about the electorates. Reporters didn't seem to be acknowledging the importance of a few key seats and those issues within the seats there were a lot of disengaged voters. And many of them didn't make up their mind until the very last week. And us journos, we were accused of talking pretty much to ourselves. So now, 2022, we thought when we planned this that we may actually already be in the middle of an election campaign. Um, but obviously things have intervened. <laughs> um, but there is there has been, in those intervening years, a loss of media. Newspapers have closed, um, regional television, radio stations have closed down or since, since, um, contracted substantially. Um, and not just in our regional and rural areas, also in our local su suburbs. There's also been a decrease in trust of journalists, not so much in the ABC, but in journalists themselves. Um, the ABC is an election issue in and of itself. There's been the rise um, of independent candidates and COVID has shown us the importance of the states, not just a federation. So what kind of election can we expect? And is political journalism in Australia failing our democracy? So in the way that we would like to start an interactive lecture is, can we have a show of hands at the beginning, and I'll ask you again at the end, where do we think we feel? Is political journalism in Australia failing our democracy? Let me know. Yes. Yeah, okay. I think we've got a little bit of convincing to do here. <laughs> so, we, I am so delighted to have our very good friends, Barry Cassidy and Patricia Calvellis, um, join us here today. Barry is an adjunct professor of journalism at RMIT. 
I want to go through a little bit of his history because I know a lot of you, particularly our newer students, won't know why he's the legend that he is. Oh, he's a household name. <laughs> he is, but maybe if you're not 18. <laughs> um, so he started writing a weekly football report back when he was a 13-year-old and became a cadet at the Albury Border Morning Mail. He's been a journalist all over the world and was the ABC's federal political correspondent in Canberra from 1979 to 1986 when he became Bob Hawke's press secretary. He stayed in that position until Keating. And then he moved to Washington because Heather Hewitt, we all know her from Backroads, amazing. Um, I left now before Keating, by the way. Pardon? I left before Keating. All right, <laughs> sorry. I saw that coming. <laughs> Back check. <laughs> um, in 2001, he started Insiders on ABC TV, which he hosted until 2019. And now he is found wherever good journalism is found including on Twitter, where he's quite opinionated these days. <laughs> now, PK is a graduate of our own RMIT program. She's covered federal politics for more than 20 years and has worked for the Australian and for Sky. She's now the host of RN Breakfast, but she is everywhere. Host of the Party Room, all over ABC TV programs, everywhere, <laughs> absolutely everywhere. Sounds overexposed. <laughs> <laughs> Not at all. But I would like to say particularly to um, our students that I think PK is an absolutely amazing role model for young journalists. She comes from a Greek Australian background and she was the first in her family to attend university. She is a role model for any young journo who wants to be the best in the business. So please follow her career with care. Okay, so questions. We're going to have 45 minutes of questions and chatting with us, and then we're going to put out to the audience, and we'll ask that Ooh, question. Oh, I'm scared of them now. Yeah, I know. There's some really hard ones. <laughs> okay, so the emphasis, of course, is on the young, the young journos in the room, but, of course, there's, there's many other people here today, and we are using the hashtag OzPolRMIT, and we're going to be very careful not to be criticising individuals. So... Let's just ask, start with that big question. Barry, do you want to start? Are political journalists in Australia failing our democracy? Um, yeah, I'd, I'd sort of like to maybe extend it rather than retreat from it right off the top by saying is it failing democracy? I think um, uh, journalism and the media um, is in some cases putting democracy at threat. Um, half the world is a democracy, but about 15% of those are what you can regard as full democracies, but twice that many are, are under authoritarian rule, so you can never take democracy for granted. Now, when you, you look at what happened in America in the last 18 months to two years, when the leader of one of the major parties refuses to accept clearly what was the, the, the um, a, a properly constituted election, and almost all of his followers believe that along with him, despite what the courts might have found, that in itself is a problem. And that when that leads to the insurrection and when the mob stormed the Capitol building, people died. And they were trying to overturn the result. Now, the important thing there is what, what role did the media have in that? Well, in my view, they had a significant role. Um, Fox News inflamed it. Fox News contributed to misinformation that went on. So many figures of Fox News refused to accept the result and ran um, Donald Trump's arguments. Um, and so, and I think Four Corners demonstrated brilliantly um, just how um, just how Fox News behaved and some of their senior people behaved through that process. So Reuben Murdoch and Fox News have to take responsibility for what happened. Now, when you get authoritarian countries around the world saying, well, look what happened in America, you want democracy, look at that. Is that what you want? And so, in effect, what Donald Trump, aided and abetted by a large section of, of the media, and they are a large section, I think did put democracy around the world at risk, um, eroded the credibility of democracy. So I think that's the really big picture that, and you wouldn't want to see anything like that here in Australia, but we can't take that for granted either because Murdoch has such a... Uh, such a big reach in this country, but 70% of the newspapers, you know, all of the newspapers in Queensland. So 
you've, you've got to be on guard to this sort of thing. So that's the, um, I think that's the bigger picture, that yes, there are, not only do they diminish democracy, but some, some of the media can be a threat to democracy itself, um, to the whole idea. Um, but as for the, um, the, the other question as to whether uh, the media is failing in terms of whether or not you're all getting the sort of political reporting that you deserve, I think that needs to be broken down into a whole bunch of, of uh, different headlines, and I'm too happy to go there. <laughs> <laughs> so I agree with broadly the thesis that's been you know, established by Barry. I do think that the Fox News elements were toxic in that election and more broadly. But I'm going to be cheeky because they are part of the media. You're absolutely right. But I don't consider them political journalists. I consider them cheerleaders and campaigners. And I don't think that they're political journalists. So when you ask this mm. question, is political journalism in Australia failing democracy? I actually think political journalism in Australia on that question is actually keeping democracy functioning because some of our institutions have been failing, including sometimes the parliament itself and the political parties that um, have been, you know, working in a particularly opaque, secretive way. And I'll give you a couple of examples because I don't actually... I agree with Barry's actual view, but it's about the definition of what is a journalist. So I'm being cheeky too. Yep. Because I don't consider Fox News uh, presenters being outraged and not accepting Trump's Trump as, you know as the one that you know, should have won and he really won and he's been robbed. I don't think that's political journalism. I think that that's partisan journalism, if you call it journalism at all. It's not my definition of journalism. The problem is that it's infected mainstream journalism. So Barry is right that it is, is it, it is actually a, a disease emerging in the broader journalism. In terms of the job that political journalists in Australia do, because I'm a big fan of them, and have been one, arguably still am, every day. I interview political leaders, but, you know, I'm not at the cold face. I'm not getting yarns every day in the press gallery. My role has changed. But if you think about some of the big stories that have kept and held the government to account and will, if, a, if there becomes a Labor government, will do the same because the journalists I know don't actually care about the colour of the government. They want to hold the institution and the people in power to account. The Brittany Higgins story, the Prime Minister's little trip to Hawaii that his office didn't really want to share much truth with. These journalists told us those stories, right? Um, it was journalists through the pe people, the whistleblowers, who were brave enough to speak, to be fair, but that's how we knew those things. We were not finding out those things in any other way. And that is where the accountability piece happens. And without those very brave journalists, and I do think it's brave to, to stand up and tell stories that make the powerful very angry with you and make the powerful punish you. Um, and good journalists stare that down. And that's what I've tried to do in my career, stare it down. It's not easy to do, though, and that's what good journalism is. And I still think that there, there is something to defend here, and I think it's, we need to defend it and we need to restore the trust in independent journalism. Is it a fair fight, though? I mean, it's one thing to go up against a PK or a Barry Cassidy. There's a lot of young people in, in Parliament trying to report is it a fair fight for them against the almighty, powerful, multiple spin doctors that there are out there when the journos are trying to file on Twitter, on copy, trying to do 20 different things at once? Can they get there? Can they do it? Um, I, I'd, I'd be interested to hear um, from you, Patricia, about how it kind of operates out of um, Canberra these days, but I haven't actually worked in Parliament House for more than 20 years. Um, when I was worked as press secretary at Bob Hawke, there were two of us as press secretaries and eventually three. And now I think there'd be 10 or 15 in his office and probably more around the building It works directly too. It's, it's an enormous PR machine now. Um, and I don't think they're all there to help you. <laughs> so, and, so I'd be interested in that, but I think the Prime Minister's office, just from the outside, it seems to me, has extraordinary influence over what is written. Um, what happens, it seems to me, a lot of the times when they get these, um, they get the leaks, is, is that they get them late, and 
So they're under pressure to file. They write the story without a lot of time to get the context and understand precisely where the story fits in the whole scheme of things. And, and they're very good at doing that kind of thing. Um, but, you know, context is everything and you've got to have the time to do it. I, I noticed a week or two ago when the Prime Minister was in Tasmania and he announced that they were going to plant 150 million trees. And I said, well, that's good, until he got the context. Three years ago, the last election, he promised a billion and delivered 1%. Now, you needed to know that. I didn't know it. And somebody in the media did because they wrote it. And it just, that's the kind of context that is so essential to your reporting. And if you're under pressure, you're busy, or you're given a leak, um, you often don't have time to do that. But, but what is it about the operation that, that I, I think they're, um, they're very good at what they do? Um, but it's obviously very different to when I last worked there. Yeah, look, I have worked there more recently and I go there a lot. Um, it's part of my job. I work like I could go for sitting weeks and, you know, see, see the place a lot. The spinning and exactly what Barry says, and I genuinely say this, I've seen it under Morrison, I saw it under Turnbull, I saw it under Abbott, I saw it under Gillard, I saw it under Rudd, and not dissimilar tactics, right? Like, you know, I... It's not a liberal problem, it's a politics problem and it ain't going away. And the, to your question of you're a young journo, you want to do good work, well, yeah, you're squeezed. So when I first entered the press gallery in 2001 or end to, like, when Barry was starting Insiders, um, I, I was given rounds so I could cultivate public service contacts and... So I got leaks, but they weren't from the Prime Minister's office. <laughs> they were from someone I knew working in sort of, you know, the Family and Community Services Department. It was like, they're going to chuck people off the youth allowance on this, and then I'd write the scoop. I worked for the Oz. They'd put it on the front page to give them credit. You know, we'd, we'd go hard. We'd, we'd, and so that's kind of the way I operated. But that's because I had the luxury. We had a big bureau back then before a lot of the redundancies. I was a young reporter. I wanted to prove myself. I liked stories. You know, I was, and I had the time. Then, the, then we had to start publishing online more. Then, you know, fewer journalists were in the newsroom. Then my role got bigger. I still kept the contacts, but it did become harder. And I've seen that happen, and I lament that. But I don't think we can cry for the past and think that we can just have that. We've got to be smarter and more savvy. I think younger journalists have actually become really, really smart at finding some of that context. They're often the ones, Barry, I find, you know, who will, because they are more, they're digital natives, that will find, you know, when the Prime Minister actually said on the record in this interview, because they found the Instagram clip, the opposite of what he just claimed. They're the ones doing that, and that matters. So I don't, I am, I like to be a mentor to younger people, not to, trash them, you know, and not go, oh, God, it was great in my day. Mm. Well, of course it was great in my day. I was given three rounds and told, you don't have to file today, work on it. Of course it was good. <laughs> but it's not like that necessarily now. And so what have we got to work with and how do we do the best work within that? Be collegiate but competitive. Um, call out the bad parts of our business because there are lots but also respect the good work that some people do. Now, I, I am very critical, and I worked for Rupert Murdoch for years, of the way that some of those newspapers operate. But I still think that some of the newsbreakers in those places, including Samantha Maiden, who just won the World War Week, broke the Brittany Higgins story, have done good work. It is a complex, nuanced story, but both can be true. And the best stories, by the way, the kind of stories that Samantha Maiden tends to break, that is stories government don't want broken. Yeah. There are any amount of, of exclusives in, in the Australian and other papers every day that the government wants you to read. And I don't think they're all that clever, quite frankly, because we know how to get them. But uh, Samantha has the skills of, of getting scoops that the government don't want out there. Yeah. They're not happy about it. And it makes her an exceptional journal. <laughs> she has done some amazing work, and there is absolutely incredible journalism out there. And as you point out, you know, some stories you're just like, wow, how did, how did they find that? How did they mm. do that? Um, but how do we get young people to engage and to listen and to, to take part of it? Because that's the part of the democratic process. You've got to, you know, tell them these stories, but someone's got to be listening. Mm. Well, the same way that you get everybody um, to take an interest. Um, 
you know, I, I always try to, um, in my reporting, and certainly at Insiders, to make make it in part a, a kind of a not an education, but an informative yeah. journalism. In other words, don't assume too much knowledge. Take take your audience with you, um, and spend a bit of time so that the context and the background is there uh, for people who might not, uh, um, you know, who, who might not know uh, or follow it as closely as, as the rest of us. And, and so, also with Insiders, we're trying to make the program a little more entertaining, perhaps, than, than some of the other um, some of the other political programs. And, and we had a lot of support along the way uh, with people with good, a good sense of humour and uh, and knew how to put together an amusing package. And uh, we had a guy called Hugh Parkinson, who knew how to uh, entertain us as well with his uh, um, with his quirky editing. Uh, so I think all of those things are important. That if you can bring bring Freshly bring people to your program. I think that helps as well. Patricia, how do you fact check someone on air? Oh, good question. <laughs> uh, <sorry. laughs> yes. right, could, you, could you could you explain to particularly to the students how do you do it? Because when you're when you go up and you say that's wrong, and then all of a sudden on Twitter, people are saying the most dreadful things. You know, you try to hold a politician to account, and you get this barrage of nastiness. Yeah, look, firstly, if you, you know, judge yourself by the responses on Twitter. I mean, I've been in one day the biggest hero on Twitter for, you know, challenging some Liberal minister and then kind of an Alan P, you know, insert really sexist, horrific, misogynistic word, um, lackey that, you know, uh, that, that, you know, is trying to prop up the government and only exists because some deal was done for me to get this job at the ABC. So that all happens in one day for me. It's a busy day. Um, <laughs> firstly, and Barry will definitely back me here, we have extraordinary other people behind the scenes who work on our programs, right? So in my case, I have producers. I have a political editor on RM Breakfast, Ali Carabon, who does fantastic work and lots of research on my interviews. So there's that. So Ali will, I'll give you, you know, you want to know how this sausage is made? She will preempt the pushback, as you call it. Oh, so they will say, look how great the unemployment figure is. Don't look at the underlying figures. <laughs> you know, women want more work, can't get it. You know, childcare's too expensive. And those facts will be in my briefs. The other way is do your bloody research, right? Like I, I read a lot, I, I, I immerse myself in these facts. So I don't quite have an encyclopedic kind of knowledge like I always wonder, I'd be the worst Prime Minister, I'd be like, oh, what's bread again? You know, um, I don't remember <laughs> facts and figures, so I need to arm myself with them, but I, I'm always, I always know what's wrong. And then you do need to contest things, you can't just let things go, but occasionally you do have to, and this is a strategy I use, you may not like it, you may love it, some very divisive, but I can't... When I have... A, the other day, I'll give you an example. I had a, someone on, a national, who was saying... And who I asked the climate change question about the floods too, right? Which a lot of people weren't asking, but I thought, I think it's relevant. So I asked the climate change question. Now, the government's changed a bit, a bit of its positioning on this, and he said, yeah, of course climate change is part of the story. And I said, yeah, absolutely. So what about doing something on emissions more? more? And he said, 2050, 2050. And I said, that's, what long, that's, that's a long time away, mate. Like, we've got a flood now. And... Um, Anyway, it was to and fro, oh, we've cut emissions, blah, blah, blah. Eventually it gets to the point where you've got, I did the, I, well, okay, we're just going to park that. We're not, it becoming a contest of yes, no, yes, no. I've tried to, as much as I can, in a very live interview, correct the record as much as I can. But I often will say, we're going to park that. That is, con what you're saying is contested, but we're just going to park that and move to the next issue. I think that's fair enough. We cannot fact check every single line that's spoken by a minister in an interview. It is impossible. But I think a good journalist should know, the, you know, the main points. And so, for instance, you know, if the Treasurer, as he was this morning, is saying how wonderful the economy is, um, you need to know that wages growth isn't happening and that maybe he needs to acknowledge that that's not in line with inflation. Now, I did know that. I challenged him. He said, absolutely, but still, how great is the economy? And it goes on. Mm. Right, Barry? Like, yeah. You can, you, you can so, only do so much in a live interview. We have other ways, though. We have online. We do fact-checking. We do lots of other ways that we do try to hold pol politicians to account.
and, and that's what I mean, and you mentioned before that you know, we talk about the old days, but we can't possibly claim we would be better journalists in the old days than people are now because we didn't have the access to the information for a start. You know, back then, research, to research an interview, you'd go to, to a dusty file, but then you'd have someone in your office who would cut out every newspaper article and then file them. And, and you'd, so you'd go to a file on climate change or whatever, and that's, that's all you'd have. And, and um, you know, like, kids these days are so much more knowledgeable than, you know, comparatively to the person of the same age 20, 30 years ago. Far much more knowledgeable because they've got access to the information at the, 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 uh, the touch of a key. And so it's, you know, back then, like, with, um, if I wanted to know something, you know, where do you go? The encyclopedia, maybe, you know, when you're in high school, if you had, had a set of encyclopedias, you didn't learn anything. And in the press gallery, you'd just go and look for the oldest, oldest bloke in the gallery, and, and, and it was all abusive, like the, the oldest person. And you'd ask them, what happened back then? We were about to, you know, sort of investigate this story. But that was research. But now, it's just extraordinary. You can, you can do your own research, if you know what you're looking for, and, and really prepare yourself well for, for your interviews. You can, but those old guys aren't there so much in the gallery anymore. So a lot of the young ones are going out and there aren't people to talk to, particularly if they're in, you know, a, a one-person newsroom. You know, there's not, you know, when I was training you know, 30 years ago, there was great sub-editors and they would kick you about oh, if you did the, if, the, if you got something wrong. And I, I still remember to this day that I wrote the story about uh, for my local paper about um, interest rates going up to 17%. I had no idea as a young, as a young cadet what that meant. And now I, uh, now I think, oh goodness, I'm so grateful that I had those sub-editors who could actually turn that into something that was readable and not hugely embarrassing to this day. Um, but Barry, you're sitting at home, you're semi-retired. Do you ever throw something at the television and go, those journalists, they're letting us down? Um. No, not so much television or radio. Um, I do get extremely frustrated with the print media at times because I think there's a partisanship in the print media now that we've never seen at this level. Um, and that really disappoints me and it, and it bothers me that the Australian still influences so much of the rest of the media in terms of the yeah. agenda and, and the sorts of stories that they're going to give priority to that day. I think that's a shame. Um, the, there's no doubt that the, the Australian is ideologically driven and it, it has a, a focus. It very carefully selects what stories they're going to run and how much prominence they give to it. Um, and I think the rest of the media have to understand that and take it for what it is. Um, there is a sort of a, I think they do create kind of a culture of fear. Um, People like Kevin Rudd and Malcolm Turnbull can take it. <laughs> they're, they're old enough and ugly enough, and when they kind of call for a Royal Commission, um, then the, 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 the news, news call are dragging out stories from, that seem to escape them when both of them are in politics, suddenly they became important. Um, but you take that, um, the, the, the example of uh, Yasmin Abdel-Magee, who, um, just to remind you of what happened there, that she, she was a young Sudanese Australian. She, she wrote on Facebook, not in any publication that, um, lest we forget, around Anzac Day, the context of lest we forget uh, Manus Island, Nauru, uh, Palestine, and so on. Now, that expression, you can argue, is owned um, by ex-servicemen. They certainly feel, a lot of them, that they do. My dad would never have had that attitude, but nevertheless, a lot, a lot do. And she, she kind of accepted that. She, she said, if I've been disrespectful, I apologise. But that didn't stop this huge pile. Uh, started with Barnaby Joyce and Peter Dutton, but in the end, I uh, saw this article that suggested that somebody had gone to the trouble that, that the Australian had written 48 articles about her, half of them analysis, commentaries. They set out to destroy her for that, and to the point where she eventually left the country. So it's that kind of um, bullying tactic uh, but I think we have to call out when we see it, and, and they're all too ready to, to defend their own ideology and, 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 and destroy the critics. And it does. It, 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 uh, I think it does scare a few people. They don't want to be the, um, the subject of a full-on attack of that kind. So I, I think that is something that, um, that does chip away at our, at our democracy. I don't think that's fair. And it's not giving, giving people the right to express themselves uh, without going overboard.
in, uh, in, the, in this case, I don't, I don't think she did. I think it was something that the board have been debated as to whether or not it's disrespectful to use the term lest we forget in any other context other than in war. Let's have the debate, but don't destroy somebody and drive them out There's of the country. There's irony too. I agree with you about that. And I also think it's funny that this is <laughs> a lot of these columnists, are, you know, very upset about cancel culture, but they are at the yeah. they are at the forefront of cancel culture, <laughs> trying to cancel people. Somebody cancelled Yasmin. About demolishing them, and I don't like cancel culture on either side. To be honest, I think that we should be having discussions. I also think that people should be allowed to make mistakes, own the mistakes, have discussions about them, and not be cancelled forever. And I actually think uh, younger people, but going back to you, young. I think we, we are, and I, I keep preempting that Barry's going to agree with me, but he's so is on this one. <laughs> we are creating, I don't know what politicians we're making for the future, but I, I despair because young people have lived their entire lives on the internet. You know, my kids, my niece and nephew, that's what they do. And, like, I don't know, when I was 19 here, I was like a radical feminist, like, you know, go through that shit. Like, that's what I did. I'm proud of that. That was part of my growth as a thinking young woman who was exploring ideas. There was nothing bad about it. It was a process of discovery. And now you, you get cancelled. You can't run. You get pre-selected with that if that's online, any of that, you know. And we saw it with Gillard where we had things that she'd done, but, but you know, they had to find for her newspaper clippings from something from Labor, Labor, you know, some women's publication, whereas now it's all like they're on the internet. So does that mean we just get, are going to have the most banal people who have never actually explored any bloody idea in their lives, never joined a club, that they might then think, why did I do that? Around and that is terrible because what sort of boring one-dimensional parliament are we going to have if we have to have that? I always remember Alexander Solzhenitsyn oh. wrote, if you're not a communist at the age of 20, there's something wrong with your heart. If you're not a capitalist by 40, there's something wrong with your head. Yeah. So it is a process. <laughs> but also, let, you know, Anthony Albanese gave an interview to a communist publication when he was 19. And the old school, that was fairly significant. <laughs> I heard an interview the other day where, they, where his name was pronounced Albanese. as Albanese. You know what, he, he now just, he, he, he uses Albanese. And I was uh, having a look for whatever reason that his um, uh, speech to Parliament, his maiden speech to Parliament, he's described himself then as Anthony Albanese. So he's made the switch. Yeah, he has. Yeah. I don't know why. Yeah, well, there is a whole change to, you know, um, to the media and a much more, uh, you know, you can see it on the ABC, there's a lot more interest in trying to get diversity represented on, on screen um, and, and on the radio as well. And there, you know, it, it's a thing and it's, and it's really impacting on our students and our graduates and, and where they can go. How important is it to have diversity in the media and in political reporting? Because I do look at insiders now on a Sunday morning and it's, you know, they're very much a particular type of person, often, not every week. Yeah, more so since I left. Um, <laughs> but in my defence, when, when insiders first started, we, we had quite a, a firm view about this, that what we wanted were gallery reporters. That was the whole point. And so our ability to be diverse was limited by the diversity in the press gallery. Um, but we should have done more in my last few years, absolutely. Um, I tried, I think, to get um, more women on the program, and boy, um, I'm not sorry for that, because the best panellists now are women, <laughs> as it turns out. Um, so, yeah, we should have done more in diversity, but now, as you say, the ABC, uh, I think, is leading in that, in that regard. You would expect SBS to be a forerunner in there as well as they are. Um, but, um, I think the ABC is doing a terrific job. I don't like it so much when they just, it's, uh, you're ticking off. You're, so, you're, you're just ticking numbers and say, right, well, we've met that criteria and that criteria and so on. And, um, there's, it's, the, the journalists, for their own sakes, have to be up to it. They've got to be really competent journalists and not chosen simply because um, of their background. Um, but there's no doubt now watching the ABC compared with even three years ago. It's far more diverse. What do you think, PK? Oh, look, I'm a big champion of this 
issue and have been for a long time. That's not a new thing for me. <laughs> um, I think, yes, it's great we're doing it on the screen. I want to see it in management structures. I want to see it behind the scenes. I don't think it's just about saying, hey, we've chosen a person of colour on the screen. So, tick, you know, we've done diversity. Diversity is when it's not always a white man that's running, you know, mm. the, the newsrooms. Like, that's, to me, diversity. And that's happening, but it's slower. What you don't see is the slower bit. Um, diversity, of course, is a big, you know, we talk about just racial diversity, uh, you know, there's sexuality, there's lots of diversity in that diversity story. Um, and I think the best, I do believe that, ex that life experience shapes the stories that you are, I think it's just common sense, the stories you are interested in and the stories that you, um, and not, not as a rule, because people become very interested in things that have nothing to do with them. But I think, you know, if you're always going to the same pool of people, so if it's always kind of white private school people, because uh, class is a big question, it was for me always, you sound different, you know, you came from the western suburbs, now I work at Radio National. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, you know, things, things can happen, wonderful things can happen. All of that diversity is important because I also, not just because it makes people feel good to see Australia on the screen, although that is very important, but I don't know, I took a real interest in the welfare round. I no one thought that was sexy, but I grew up on welfare. And it really, and when I, I cared about it. I genuinely cared about it. Like I thought it would mattered a lot. So, and that was because that, if, if it wasn't for state education, and a good social welfare system, I would not be on this stage. So those issues mattered to me. So as a journalist, I took an interest in it. So when they cut payments, I wrote a lot of stories about it, even at the odds, and they would run them. <laughs> I don't know. I haven't figured that one out yet. <laughs> It is an issue. Um, I'm thinking about the upcoming election. Back when I um, was reporting, we used to very carefully measure how many seconds the Labor Party got, the Liberals got, and the Independents would get this small amount down the side. How now can you be fair in that with the rise of the Independents? How, how, can, you, how can you work it out so you can actually make it you know, a real yeah, debate? That, that's what's wrong with the line count. Um, You've just got to make it broadly um, see to it that you're giving roughly equal coverage. Um, we once would have said both sides of politics, but now um, it may be that this election the penny hasn't dropped yet. It will. <laughs> it's about to drop big time. Um, that the, the independents now are big players and they do demand. Um, certainly the same coverage as the Greens and the, and, and the other major contributors. So uh, there aren't that many independents in the parliament now, but um, we're about to see a change. We're about to see a, a real shift, I think, in, in the, the, that's, that's really going to... This will be the biggest impact on the two-party process. I'm not suggesting that in minority government. I don't think we will. But there'll be enough independents after the election to suggest um, that if this trend continues, Minority governments might be quite the thing of the future, and then independents will have a lot of influence. You know, they're already having considerable influence. Look what's happened just, just by the fact that independents now have got a chance to win quite a few seats um, around the country, and certainly in three states at least. The moderates, you barely heard a thing from the moderates in the Liberal Party after Malcolm Turnbull. A lot of them left when he left. But nevertheless, they became ineffective and they seemed to accept that the right of the party was now in control. And then suddenly with, with the political imperative and the threat of losing their seats, because, and I think cleverly, most of the independents have targeted moderate liberals, because they're not doing their job. Um, they just went quiet. So all of a sudden, they were outspoken on, um, on the religious discrimination bill. They're now having a lot more to say on climate change because they know if they don't, I'll lose their seats. They might anyway. Um, so they're already having having a victory. Um, in some cases, I'm seeing independents that didn't really give a lot of um, chances of actually winning. Now I think they're they're red hot chance. Um, like a couple in like Trent Zimmerman and um, and David Sharp. Now they have a couple of moderates in New South Wales, and they're being targeted. And I think they're in real trouble. Big trouble. 
Uh, Zoe Daniel here in Victoria, I, I, I wouldn't have necessarily thought, I thought well, she's, she's good. Um, if she gets the right support, she'll, she'll be around, around the mark now, I think she's got a red up chance. Um, and it's because of this kind of, I, I think people have had enough of, uh, of, the, of the way some of the, uh, the major parties have performed. Uh, they've let them down and, and if you take the situation now where the independents are pushing three issues in particular, they're pushing the women's issue, hard climate change and, uh, and the integrity issue, which I think is the big sleeper on it. Boy, that, this decision not to have a national integrity commission is stupid and that's going to cost them because that's just so defensive. That's the, I don't want one for the obvious reasons. Um, we talk about uh, you know, a threat to democracy. Um, it's right there. So I think that they've identified really strong issues um, and as a result, not only will, have they changed, already changed attitudes within the government, but the Labor Party must know that if they win minority government, they're going to have to do better on climate change. Just putting out a policy that gets them over the line, that is just enough to get by and not enough for the government to destroy them, is not the way to run a climate change policy. You've got to have a strong, committed climate change policy. And the independents will see to that. Um, and even if they're, even if they're not, um, not holding the balance of power, I still think they'll have enough influence around the place uh, to keep the Labor Party honest and government as well if they were to win the election. Made was they're already having a victory whether they win or not, because I think he's right. They have put the sort of, you know, fire under the bottoms of a couple of people who are like, oh gosh, and they are very worried, uh, openly so, actually. Um, so I don't know, I, I wouldn't call it yet though. Um, I don't know if we're quite at sort of, you know, they're going to sweep the country or sweep those particular areas. I think that they're, I think they've never been in a better position. But I think I'm, I'm probably stung after the last election. I think that, you know, the, this, the terminology the Prime Minister used, which is very loaded, but the quiet Australians, I don't know if we've got a handle on how those people really are feeling at the moment, those, those key people. Clearly they're fatigued by the pandemic. They're very you know, grumpy about some of that. But a lot of the issues are changing now and politics moves fast and I don't know, I would not pick it at this stage. I don't think we're there yet. In terms of the original question you asked though about the, you know, the equal time. Yeah, we look, we follow our rules. Yeah, you try and give people, e yeah, but you, you try to give people even, even coverage. It's the, the difference though with the independence this time around the last time is, is look at the role models who are out there and people like Sally Stegall, Helen Haynes, have just, um, I think they've given credibility to the independence movement. And as well as that, they're now far more organised, they've got a lot more money than they ever had. And that's why I take them far more seriously. And on the question who will win the election, I'm not making a prediction, but I will make one very strong point about the election. That it, and it's not that you can trust polls, but they give you some sense of where we are at the moment. And no political party has ever won an election from this far behind, this close to an election. No political party has ever done it. That's not a prediction. That's not saying that, therefore, Labor wins the next election. I'm just telling you how tough it is for Scott Morrison to hang on. Um, it'd have to be unprecedented. I want to um, just say we should be getting ready for some questions from the audience. But while that is being organised, I just um, want to... I'm really worried about the lack of local news. You know, it's all well and good to hear about Morrison and, and Al, um, Albo, but I'm really more interested in who my local member's going to be. I don't, I'm not getting that coverage, even in suburban Melbourne. Suburban Melbourne, it's easier if you're in the regions because you have your own television station or you've got your own newspaper and there's a lot more focus on the local contest as there should be. Um, it's, it's hard in some respects, in the suburbs, and that's why it's so important just to get up the sort of the appearance. Um, you've just got to be everywhere, and that's why the billboards are so important. Um, so, look, the, uh, the, lo the local coverage uh, is a really important issue, but keep in mind that the difference between Australia and the US is in the US they have a presidential election, it's all about two people. In Australia, at least, 
it's for electorate to electorate. And everybody votes in, 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 in an electorate separately to the Prime Minister. They, they're quite conscious of how their vote is going to affect who will be Prime Minister at the end of the, end of the day. But they also know they have other considerations. Their candidates at the local level and the issues at the local level. They're all very conscious about those about those local issues. So it's, it's in their minds, the coverage might not be there, uh, but those who care will get the information. Okay, let's go and get some hard questions from the audience. Um, there's a microphone there with Tito. Tito, feel free to choose someone. Can you ask them to take the handheld mic on? I think it needs to be pushed yep. up. Yep, the, the green light's on, so it'll be working. Green light's on. Yes, it is. Yep. One, two. Yeah. Cool. Um, my question is for either of you, but um, perhaps Patricia, as you were most recently uh, part of the Walkley judging panel. Uh, I think you left in, when was it, 2020, maybe? Uh, yes, you've done your research. Yeah. <laughs> I was just curious about... Deliberations are confidential, my friend. <laughs> I, was, I was curious about what role you think um, awards play when it comes to thinking about, like, the journalists and the, the stories that they pursue or how they think about their stories. Do you think it, it is a consideration for journalists oh, and maybe yeah. it's impacting on their work in a way? Yeah. Oh, look, I don't know any industry where people don't like winning an award. <laughs> people love an award. <laughs> My kids love awards. Everyone loves an award. Um, and the Walkleys are a prestigious... Yeah, award, and does it, if it does anything, it's only positive. It incentivises people wanting to break the best yarn of the year so that they can win an award. And I think some people are driven by, you know, loving accolades. And if that means they're doing good work, that's fantastic. Um, and I think it's important also on a serious note, because I'm not all, only comical, although mainly, and I've been up since 3.30. Um, but also, <laughs> I, I do think that it's important to to as the gold this week and, you know, whatever, to recognise good work, to say we value that, we value that as an industry. We think that's the kind of work you should do. Yeah, because that's what really you're doing, you're sending a message too. Um, does it matter? Oh, I've got shortlisted ones, I've never won a Walkley. Do I cry at night about it? Not really. Um, I love my job. I think lots of good journalists haven't won awards as well. Uh, and lots of really good journalists have. It's a bit of luck of the draw, to be honest, some of it. But when you reward an excellent yarn or a scoop, that's fantastic because that person deserves that, that acclaim, but also it does send a message, as it did with the Brittany Higgins gold logie. That is that we want those stories. We think it's important that women's voices are heard. That is a bigger message, that award. We think that the silencing of women in our national parliament is no longer acceptable, as an industry too. So to our male gatekeepers, I'm going to give a speech about this at International Women's Day next week, <laughs> to our male gatekeepers, I would have not even known that I could get that story up 20 years ago, because it was a boys' club. So something is changing, and we're rewarding it, and I'm very happy about it. Fantastic. <laughs> Question Hello, here. yes, everyone. Thank you for coming, both of you. Um, my question was sort of jumping off this idea of the balanced reporting um, between the two parties and then the independents. And how do you think that you can work to control, you know, the big PR machine that you were talking about, Barry, how you can control a narrative when it's running off course and say people aren't being heard because there's big scoops on one person? every day in the campaign. So it's not easy for the independents because the, the major parties and certainly the incumbent government has the benefit of incumbency. They can make real announcements that affect people's lives, provided they're followed through on. Uh, and so those sort of things are, 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 gives them a big advantage. Um, the independents, uh, you get somebody like Clive Palmer who can spend $70 million, um, or waste $70 million, um, it's just, you know, so that gives him a big advantage because he's got very deep pockets and he's prepared to spend the money. So it's, it's, it's not easy, independence, we've got to find different ways. But uh, I think the way that they're doing it now is just it's this kind of community-based activity that goes on and this, this presence that's everywhere. Um, I can't recall the, uh, the member in Victoria, 
um, from Shepparton, um, who emerged from nowhere about two or three weeks before the state election. Oh, yes. And, and she hadn't put a hand up. And suddenly, two or three weeks out, it was a fixed term, people knew where the election was, two or three weeks out, suddenly these billboards went up all over town. What is this? The, the fact that her husband had delivered most of the babies around Shepparton for the last 20 years <laughs> helped because she gave them a bit of a, a presence. But she'd organised the, the Shepparton News and she'd organised um, the local mayor to support her. And she went from zero to 100 in a matter of a few weeks. And it was all about this side of kind of just the presence around the place and a credible candidate. And, and I think we're, she was the forerunner in some respects to that. And, uh, and we're, starting, we're starting to see that now, I think, take off as an onset. I think we've got another one here. Um, it occurs to me that the line with podcasting and social media, that the line between journalism and opinion or columnists seems to be blurrier than ever. Do you agree with that? And if you do, is it a problem? You've got the podcast. <laughs> Thank you. Yes, you've been a regular Come on again. Um, uh, okay. It's not a science what we do. Uh, I believe that what we do on a, something like a podcast is analysis, and it's exactly what Barry said earlier on. We should explain things, give context. We try and do a lot of that. And that's why people find it... Engaging because we don't just go the tax cut and assume people understand it. We'll, we'll try and unpack it and then explain why you know someone is pushing this particular line or whatever. Um, that is analysis. I don't go on my podcast and say, and my opinion is, uh, it's this is my analysis of how this is working out. There is a fine line though, mm. and I do think that it's very easy to breach that line and you need to be hyper aware of it. And we certainly are at the ABC or in our podcast, we're really aware of it and, and really conscious of it. Not, not to get in trouble, but because it's just not what we're paid to do. Like it's just not, it's not our shtick, right? But you ask, so there's that for me, my personal work, but in terms of news and, um, and, and opinion, yeah, I do think there is um, too much of a blur sometimes. And I think sometimes there are stories that are written in a really kind of loaded way where the emphasis is pretty hefty on the, uh, the old value and opinion. And I don't think that's the best kind of journalism. And it is concerning. And I just think I'm old fashioned on this because I'm like kind of, I straddle the generations, you know. I'm not, I'm not a digital native, but really the internet was is becoming a thing when I was at the end of high school. Like, it's not like not something I'm very used to, but I'm still old fashioned. I did work in a newspaper, I did traditional cadetship, and I think opinion should be on that page, thank you very much, and I think the other copy. And I think it should be clearly marked and you know what you're getting, right? You know what's on the label, you know what's actually being sold to you. This is milk, this is, you know, a potato. And, and you shouldn't be blurring them. I think it's actually back to does it failing democracy. I think that does fail democracy. News stories should be facts. And you should always follow the facts. Even if you don't agree, you don't like the facts. <laughs> you know what I mean? Um, it doesn't matter because a fact is a fact. There's a question up the back. Hi, um, thank you for tonight, it's been great. Um, my question is to both of you. Um, Barry, I agree with you about those three um, key issues in this upcoming election, um, but I do feel there's um, the solution to that problem seems to be a conversation about independence. Um, and there is a political party out there that um, is kind of serving on those issues of climate integrity and gender representation. Um, I did want to give out two examples, um, for instance, with that Big Deal documentary that was on the ABC that seemed to say uh, part one was about um, donations in politics is bad for major parties and part two seemed to say grassroots movements like in Indi are the answer, ignoring that um, the Greens as a political party has had really strong um, political donation disclosure laws for a really long time and doesn't take money from bad actors um, and is also a grassroots organising um, party. Um, and also um, the misrepresented documentary series um, that failed to include um, Christine Milne, who was uh, an amazing leader for the Greens for a really long time, um, chose to have Sarah Hansen-Young on 
for a narrative about what happened to her, which was obviously awful, um, but, you know, didn't fail to... Uh, it failed to um, highlight that, you know, the Greens do have gender representation, equal levels at the federal level. The question is... Sorry, <laughs> that was a bit of a rant, sorry. I'm sorry. that you're uh, a fan of the Greens. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, my, my question is, like, you know, why, why is the immediate answer independence and why is the media too scared to highlight a political party that has been doing the right things on these issues for a long time? I don't think the media should be highlighting a political party and saying it does a good job. I think it should just be telling what the facts are and you can decide what you like. Um, you might feel like the Greens are being marginalised. Well, I don't know. Like, I have Adam Bant on my show and he's a Greens leader and... You know, I don't the, hear so much from the Greens anymore. They used to be all over the place all the time. Well, the, Green, the Greens have, have struggled to build their vote. Um, and, yeah. Which um, is surprising with climate change and floods and fires and everything else that we are going through, you'd think. But anyway, not a question from me. There's one here. <laughs> yes. I'd just like to ask the question and put that, uh, is the political journalism in Australia failing our democracy? and say, are our politicians and political parties and political parties and the press that are, or the owners of the press failing our democracy? Yeah, well, I think that's what we were kind of touching on. I was attempting to by, by saying that I, I do think the proprietors have a role in this, and I, I think I made it fairly clear that I think one proprietor in particular is, uh, is letting down democracy. Look, it's, it's, there are so many ways in which I think um, um, not just so much the political journalism but the way that politics is covered um, has changed for the worse. Um, look, it's, it's the emergence of um, the celebrity thing or the, um, the, the drift away from discussions around policies more towards the personalities. I saw one study in the United States where this is going back 20 years where I think the, the discussion around policies is halved, and this is kind of the, um, the, the digital era, I suppose, um, but the focus on personalities has tripled in that time. And there's been that shift, and it, and it also leads you to the kind of the personality journalist thing too. I, I don't think anybody sets out not, I don't know when I say nobody, some do, but most don't set out to be a, a, a celebrity journalist as such. Um, but you, you become known, so you become a well-known journalist without being a celebrity, but some of them then um, allow that to consume them and they become entertainment reporters. The, one of the worst examples of this, and it might be digress slightly from what the question was, but when Piers Morgan arrived in Australia the other day, now Piers Morgan is a, is a, is a, is a dreadful character, right? <laughs> <laughs> This guy was the editor of the Daily Mirror when the hacking went on, when they were hacking the phones of the, the parents of a murdered schoolgirl and the, and, and the, and the families of, of soldiers who'd been killed overseas, right? And he, the, the, the inquiry found that he actually probably knew that this was going on, but they made this remark. They thought that he, he thought it all was a bit of a joke. Now, that, that's Piers Morgan. Now, he arrives in Australia. The Prime Minister gives him 40 minutes of his time, which is about as much time as you give the leader of a small or medium-sized country. And he gives us a celebrity journalist, I think Elba did as well. You did. Um, and, and so this kind of recognition of these people by the politicians, I just find that obscene. I mean, it's... Um, but that goes on at a much lower level, but this is the first time that I've seen somebody of that ilk given so much time by the political leaders that just... Uh, and both of them, as you say, weird. Yep. You know, and as much of the country was flooding, and people were losing it was their actually lives. Just before the floods. Just before the just floods. Before the floods yeah. Ir irrelevant, as you say, small, medium-sized country. Yeah. That point was very well made. Hmm? Okay, I think we are now at time, so I need to ask you the question again. Is political journalism in Australia failing our democracy? Is that a yes? yes. yes. Still, did we convince <laughs> anyone? We've lost the numbers. We've I lost think we the did. numbers. Lost the numbers, yeah. I think we've, we've pretty much agreed that there is a problem out there, not so much of the journalists making, but perhaps some journalists are potentially complicit. 
And certainly when there is a change in leadership in some of our media organisations, things may change. I worry too, and I think we need to have another whole panel on social media, Google and Facebook and other, mm -hmm. um, and the impact of those platforms on misinformation and trust in journalism. Mm. But um, right now, can I ask Patrick and Rebecca to come up to say thank you very much? Casper. I've been, I've been given the wrong names. Don't you hate that? Vadita <laughs> and Casper. Please, here is a little present. And can I just say that the shop tuned it for me, both of them, and said that it should Im uh, give you a better outcome than the Prime Minister currently has. <laughs> <laughs> do we get a ukulele? You do. <laughs> That's so good. <laughs> it is. It's a yuke. That is really good. Thank you very much. A round of applause for Barry and Patricia. Hopefully you can sing better than the Prime Minister. <laughs> Thank you, everyone. Good night.